Uh, Laurier recently appointed two new CG research chairs. Audra Mitchell is one of those. Um, Audra, Dr. Audra Mitchell is an accomplished interdisciplinary scholar. She explained to me recently that she draws her ideas and tools from across social science disciplines when she believes they're appropriate for her work. Her scholarship motivated for a concern by a concern for large-scale harm, which she'll be talking about tonight, advances a more expansive understanding of the world, one that transcends the limits of locally constructed realities. Visit her blog, Worldly, uh, as I did today, and I'm willing to wager that you'll be a regular visitor. Dr. Mitchell is also an accomplished artist. She uses her canvases and sculptures compellingly to visit deep ideas through an alternative and informative lens. Please welcome Dr. Mitchell, who will introduce you to a new perspective on the development goals. Well, thanks very much for the kind introduction, and it is a real honor to be here tonight. This is my first event with the 2030 Plus group and at the Balsilli School, so thank you all for being here. Uh, right, so I want to talk a little bit about an issue that isn't in the mainstream of policy making and is sort of hidden within the SDGs, but it's something that I think we should all be aware of, something that needs to be central to global governance and policy making, and that's extinction. So I'll start off oh, by asking, mass extinction, what is it, and why should we be worried about it? Well, let's start off with the most commonly used, although, as I'll say in a moment, perhaps not the best, scientific definitions of these terms. So, in the standard definition, extinction is the death of every member of a species. And mass extinction involves the elimination of three quarters of extant species within a relatively short time scale. Now, here we're talking in terms of ecological time, so this could be thousands or even millions of years. However, Recent research shows that extinction rates across species and globally are increasing at hundreds or even thousands of the times of the background, the normal background rate. So that's the rate of extinctions we would expect to see without human interventions. So for instance, in uh, late 2014, the WWF, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, reported a decrease in biodiversity of 52% between 1970 and 2010 alone, so that's just 40 years. Recent research suggests that existing models such as these probably actually underestimate the rate at which extinctions are occurring and accelerating. Anthony Barnowski, a leading scholar of extinction, suggests that these increased rates may produce a mass extinction event within just two to three centuries. But to get a really good grasp of why mass extinction is important to global governance and ethics, we need to look beyond just these definitions. For one thing, these definitions don't take account of the possibility of human extinction. Extinction is treated as something that happens to other species. But scholars of existential risk identify a number of possible factors that might threaten Homo sapiens, everything from asteroid strikes to the development of hostile forms of artificial intelligence. And of course, indirect human extinction through the collapse of ecosystems. So these scientific definitions are solely biological and in some cases merged with economic understandings of what biodiversity is and what it's worth. They don't reflect the fact that extinction involves the elimination of entire life forms and multi-species worlds, each of which has its own history and unique future. Beyond all this, when we're talking about mass extinction, we're talking about the future of life on Earth. So all other goals, the elimination of poverty, increased health, gender equality, all of these things presume at least that life on Earth is going to continue and that we can improve it. Well, a mass extinction event puts all of that in jeopardy. Now, despite how serious all of this sounds, there's currently no international normative or legal framework for dealing with mass extinction, and I think this is pretty stunning considering the stakes we're dealing with. There are hundreds of national and international agreements concerning biodiversity and conservation, but there's no designated framework for dealing with the harm of extinction, let alone mass extinction. In fact, I think it's very telling that the word extinction doesn't appear in the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is the major treaty governing these issues. 
Now this creates a policy context in which national and international actors are making policies intended to manage biological processes as if they're going to go on roughly as usual with a few uh, hitches. They're not prepared to confront mass extinction or the major shocks that accelerating extinction on a global scale will bring. So let's talk a little bit about these matters in terms of the SDGs. Now, in some ways, the SDGs seem to address the issue of extinction to take it head on. Targets 14 and 15 in particular deal with a whole suite of targets for protecting, or goals rather, for protecting marine and territorial ecosystems. They include the creation of parks and protected spaces, reduction in the rates of ocean acidification, which is causing extinctions of many fish species, coral reefs, and things, etc. Uh, ending trafficking in endangered species, controlling so-called invasive species, integrating biodiversity values into the mainstream of public policy making, and the fair sharing of genetic resources, which I'll come back to in just a moment. Now, these are not new goals. I have to say most of them are taken from existing agreements such as the CBD or the Nagoya Protocol. Now, the SDGs do use the term extinction, so they get a couple of points there. Target 15.5 aims to halt the loss of biodiversity and, by 2020, protect and prevent the extinction of threatened species. Now, how they intend to achieve in five years what the CBD hasn't been able to in almost 25, or indeed that the conservation movement, the global conservation movement, hasn't in over two centuries, is one question. But there are more fundamental issues with this approach. First, it goes on a species-by-species species or ecosystem-by-ecosystem ecosystem basis. So it assumes that certain species and threatened ecosystems can be targeted for protection piecemeal. But any ecologist worth her salt will tell you that no species and no particular ecosystem can be isolated from the Earth's biomes. In particular, extinction events are characterized by the fact that they're global, they're non-linear, and they're based on complex linkages amongst species and amongst inorganic and organic beings. Now, some species, uh, for instance, go uh, extinct immediately along with symbionts, predators, prey, parasites, etc. While others are eliminated in what are called extinction cascades, which can go on for decades or even centuries, so that's when one species goes extinct and causes the extinctions of others for whom uh, it is necessary for their survival. Now, it's not always possible to tell which species or the extinction of which species will set off such a cascade and therefore to ensure the protection of those species that might be affected by it. In other words, this is a very holistic problem. It can't be dealt with piece by piece. Second, the timescales of the SDGs make little sense. At most, they look forward to the next decade and a half. Well, as I mentioned, extinction is something that's hap that happens over centuries, and in this case, at least a couple of centuries. Now, this may allow policymakers to say, oh, well, that's far beyond our remit, that's irrelevant to policy making now, and we have other priorities that are more urgent. However, if a mass extinction event happens in 200 years, and remember, we're talking here about the elimination of three quarters of existing life on Earth, then it's something that should be factored into contemporary policy making if we are to take that long view that Terry mentioned in his introduction. Because even if the extinction event were to be completed in two to three centuries, that means that it's happening right now. We're in the midst of it, even if it hasn't become what it will ultimately be. It's a little bit of uh, abstract philosophical ranting for you there. But long-term responses need to be happening right now. We need to be making policy changes right now. Third, the SDGs, like the CBD before them, remain tied to the model of state sovereignty, which is based on the control of states over their own territory. In fact, as in other key conservation policies that preceded them, the SDGs use natural resources as a key issue for entrenching state sovereignty, saying to states, hey, this is part of your resource base, this is part of the way that you can assert yourself as an autonomous state. As such, they rely on states to create protected spaces and to enforce laws, rather than addressing this global issue through global forms of governance. So, Unfortunately, this paradigm reflects neither the interconnected nature of life on Earth, nor those complex dynamics of extinction events that I mentioned earlier. So for instance, we see marine protected areas, which are a major plank of Target 15. They actually reflect the boundaries of nation states and their marine boundaries. Well, water and many marine biota just don't respect boundaries. In fact, many of them are migratory. 
Now, there is a specific international treaty protecting migratory animals, but again, it relies on compliance by particular states. Also, it's all very well to create static sanctuaries, but issues such as ocean acidification and plastic pollution just don't stay put. So the reliance on state sovereignty enforces the piecemeal approach to the protection of specific species and ecosystems, rather than addressing the complex dynamics of this global phenomenon. Now, very briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about our main themes tonight, which are health and food, and how, and of course, economic security along with them, and how mass extinction may affect them. Now, all of the, this phenomenon, I mean, has a really major effect on targets one, two, and three in particular. The processes of extinction that are contributing to the global crisis and the potential future events are having economic effects right now. For instance, crops such as Arabica coffee and certain strains of bananas, as well as several strains of rice, face extinction. So these crops provide subsistence, but also export income to hundreds of millions of people concentrated in the global south. So, of course, their extinction threatens both food and economic security. Targets one and two also aim to provide equal rights to economic and gene genetic pardon me, resources. However, from its 19th century roots, conservation has often involved the expropriation of land, primarily from indigenous communities and the poor. And since the 1980s, neoliberalization has turned conservation into a profit-making industry to the extent that there are now biodiversity derivatives in which one can hedge and profit on the extinction of particular species. So as many authors have pointed out, conservation tends to concentrate wealth and access in the hands of the global north. Now, this is also important in the area of health. Bioprospecting for organisms that may prove valuable as medicines are largely carried out by major pharmaceutical companies. This can lead to the expropriation of knowledge and genetic materials that, instead of increasing access to medicine for the poor, may, uh, for instance, fragment or destroy indigenous health practices. The same is true of seed and gene bank projects, which are intended to maintain genetic diversity by archiving seeds uh, or genes of species that are thought to be important for food security in the future. Essentially, this involves removing them from their context and from the communities that have worked with them over centuries and putting them in remote locations, like up on Svalbard, which is where one of the major seed, uh, seed repositories in the world is located. So again, access to these materials is annexed for the political, economic, and scientific elite. Now, of course, the Nagoya Protocol of 2010 is intended to ensure the fair sharing of these materials, but it, re it relates to the relations between states and how they share information and technological expertise, not to how citizens and communities might get a hold of these resources. Okay, so. I'm going to finish here, but what I want to say is that the bottom line of, of the points I've made tonight is that all of the SDGs rely on the continuity of diverse, complexly connected ecospheres. And this is what extinction and the possibility of a mass extinction directly threaten. So unless the SDGs can appropriately identify and respond to the phenomenon of mass extinction, their goals are in jeopardy. Thanks very much. <laughs>